the uh, papers, front page of the uh, Times and the front page of all the English newspapers as well. It's uh, Corey Coco Goff, who beat her idol, Venus Williams. She's 15. Sky's the limit for Goff. Uh, is that how it is? Goff? Yeah. yeah. Uh, beaten Williams tips 15 year old conqueror for greatness and then night in desert drives England so an interesting story from Phil Neville that they went to Qatar having been beaten 2-0 in was it a friendly against Sweden um, it was a friendly yes. so Sweden hammered them 2-0 Phil Neville had crisis talks after in a, at a January training session in Qatar brought them out into the desert for dinner and uh, a night of Soul searching happened, and ever after that, they were all friends, and here we are in the semi-finals. Uh, they, they are in the semi-finals. Villa facing investigation. Aston Villa facing a Premier League investigation after selling Villa Park for fifty-six point seven million to comply with profit and sustainability rules. The club's accounts for the year ending May thirty-first, twenty nineteen, were signed off by the EFL as compliant with its profit and sustainability regulations last month, but they've yet to be authorised by the Premier League, which received Villa's books last weekend after their promotion via the Skybet Championship playoffs in May. So. Uh, Villa's finances were a bit of a mess. A couple of changes of ownership. Looked like they were going to the wall. Looked like Grealish was going to leave. And then new owner comes in. And, um, you know, there was a little bit of... a little bit of... creativity in the solutions that were found. The English Football League were like, yeah, off you go. Nothing to see here. The Premier League might be a little more circumspect when it comes to these issues. Are they okay? Is uh, I don't know. I mean, that would be that's the first question you'd have. That'd be a very villa thing to uh, get to the point where everything is looking good again. And suddenly, it's, oh no! The back page of the Mirror this morning is splash the cash rash. Marcus Rashford there after signing his new three hundred thousand pound a week deal including bonuses. He signed up at Old Trafford until 2023. Bernard Flynn is writing about Tyrone. Red Hands starting to right wrongs. He fancies Tyrone coming through the qualifiers. Big game against Cavan this weekend. Uh, O'Keefe, now we want the big one. That's their Wexford lead. And uh, Lilies just keep on winning, they say, also on the back page of the mirror. Dundalk beating Watford 3-0 last night. Uh, 15 love, Coco. Corey Goff stunned Venus Williams. Then Camley stated, I want to be the greatest. Uh, Ringwalk, a Tokyo shift as focus is now on 2020. So this is Kurt Walker who has insisted the European <coughs> Games is only a stepping stone that's him pictured with his gold medal. And Zahahaha, Palace laugh after risery, five-year payment plan. This is one of the all-time uh, great transfer story leads from Neil Ashton. Penny-pinching Arsenal have made a derisory 40 million bid for Wil Wilfred Zaha with Argus-style payments over five years. Five years is all in capitals, in case you don't realise that that's unusual. Crystal Palace, who rate their star man at an eye-watering 120 million, laughed off the measly offer and labelled the Gunners Efforts embarrassing. Incredibly, cheeky Arsenal also demanded a hefty discount in capitals and bold if they managed to cobble together the cash to pay off bits of Zaha's transfer fee early. I'd say a stage payment plan is exactly how most transfers are done. Or like the vast majority of them. Yeah, they, they, I would say a lot of them are as well, but the, what's the instalment on that? What's he mentioning there? I'm, I'm not Five I'm not years, quite sure. eh, 40 million over like, five years. Come on, five years. Is really every transfer done over five years most for 40 be. million? Well, mo yeah, most you don't. Well, because it's just a carousel of cash. Who has 40 million in cash in one day to give to somebody else? It's a lot of money. It's a lot of actual money. Whereas you get on the... And then if you buy Zaha for 40 million, you can uh, amortize them over a similar period, so his value gets down to nothing, which is, in Arsenal's case, very important, because obviously they want people to tie him down to a second contract, because no one's going to sign a second contract with Arsenal, as we've seen. Uh, and so it's just a financial thing. But, I mean, obviously, Palace are leaking this now, because maybe they're going to sell Zaha? Is that what's happening? I'm not sure if it's Palace leaking it as much as, perhaps, Wilfred Zaha's brothers, who want him to go, and who want him to leave, to go to Arsenal, and they've been on the record, one of them in particular, saying that they hope Crystal Palace actually just sell and actually get on with this and allow him to fulfil his dreams. The thing is, £40 million is not going to be able to prize Wilfred Zaha away from Crystal Palace. A, they don't need the money anymore after signing Aaron wan for for million quid. B, they will value him at way more than £40 million because, as I just mentioned, they sold Aaron wan for £50 million. Quid. They value him at £100 million, which in my view is a little bit ludicrous for a player like Wilfred Zaha. He will improve and his statistics will go up playing for a better team. As bad as Arsenal are, they're a better team than Crystal Palace, I think we're, we're safe to say. But Arsenal are in a sorry state at the moment. Being able to actually afford Wilfred Zaha at a higher price is just not going to happen for them. 40 million quid is breaking the bank for Arsenal when it comes to this transfer window. So don't buy, don't buy young English players. Go off and shop around the world. 
do the thing right. that made you great in the first place, use a scouting network, sign some players who are undervalued. Like, you know, there's a guy who Bayern Munich signed from, was it, was it, was it, Borussia, who, who was, this guy Gnabry, I mean, he might, he's a good guy, check out him. He might be decent in the future. He might be good. A eh, Arsenal? What do you think of that? Mm. Yeah, that's a particular salt in the wound, to be quite honest with you. I don't know, it's, you like, there's been a lot written over the last couple of days, but you're right, there are so many other options around the continent that might be better value, that would definitely be better value than Wilfred Zaha. The thing is, you're getting, I guess, tried and trusted Premier League talent in Wilfred Zaha, you're getting somebody who will help commercially, or that actually gives the illusion that Arsenal are making big money signings. I mean, you go out and, say for, say for example, if Serge Gnabry didn't play for Arsenal at one point in the past, or if he played for a lesser Bundesliga team, and he's just as good as Wilfred Zaha, and you sign him from a middle-tier Bundesliga team, people will be like, who the hell is this guy? He might be just as effective as Wilfred Zaha, and their transfer dealings look tame and meek and not actually that ambitious. Whereas Wilfred Zaha, if, they, if Arsenal suddenly stump up with £50 million and they sign Wilfred Zaha next week, people will be like, well done on being ambitious. But how effective will he be in reality? It was Kieran Cunningham who at the weekend was talking about um, if you Google Andy Robertson ambition, you see when Liverpool signed him, the Liverpool fans were all like, ah, this is a complete lack of ambition signing this guy who can't even get that much game time for Hull, he's been relegated. Anyway, he's Scottish. What the hell? It's only eight million. But like, what is ambition? The ambition is taking somebody like Andy Robertson and turning him into a world-class superstar. Well, the ambition is to be a better team than your finances allow and you're up against Manchester City and you're up against other teams who have loads of money, so you need to shop differently and you need to shop better and you need to shop with brains and signing Wilfred Zaha for whatever amount of money is, it's like, that's not really going to work for Arsenal. No, not anymore. Unless, unless he actually is going to become uh, a player who takes the leap from his quality now to the type of quality that we see from Mo Salah. Like, if that's what, if Arsenal really believe he's Mo Salah in waiting, then by all means go for it and spend the 50 million. But he needs to reach that level if you're going to start shopping in England with established Premier League players. Otherwise, you've got to go... So Spurs are signing some midfielder for seventy-five million, who Leon bought last year for eight. In Dombele, yeah. They need to get the. They need to get in when he's eight million, and that's what Arsenal. That's what made them great in the first place. It was signing players from the reserve team or the subs bench of other teams or players who had bust, and like Wenger's genius wasn't recognizing uh, or uh, great talent that nobody else could spot. It was seeing great talent that just was underperforming and paying okay amounts of money for it. Like, Vieira was on the bench in AC Milan and became the best English midfielder of his generation, or at least as good as Roy Keane. And um, they're, they're not doing that now. Like, Wilfred Zaha is not this hidden gem who nobody knows about. Everybody's seen his performances week in, week out. All the information is available on him. You need to be signing the next guys who are a bit behind him if you want to turn that club back into something that has the potential to be a top four team. Sure, like Swiss Ramble on Twitter has some very depressing statistics from an Arsenal perspective about 24 hours ago on his Twitter page, just talking about how Arsenal were in that position not uh, seven years ago, where they were able to go toe to toe with most of the big teams in England, with pretty much every team in England in terms of their actual profit, in terms of their spending power, and now that has been diminished hugely. So. It's kind of really contradictory that they're going out and actually making this sort of spending. I do feel, though, that we're almost at the cap here. The brothers of Wilfred Zaha might suggest that Arsenal should just push it up a little bit and Crystal Palace might accept that offer. But really, after the Wan-Bissaka money, they're not, if Zaha is semi-interested in playing for Crystal Palace next year, they'll be able to keep him. The only thing is, if he kicks up a massive fuss, this is going to go on and on and on because of the African Cup of Nations and Ivory Coast involvement. So... You'll see this, like Zaha, ha, 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 maybe tab of the morning this morning, and it could be the best headline we see on this for weeks. People, the sub, the sub editors of every newspaper need to get working on their Zaha puns right now because we're going to have this for the next few weeks. Uh, back page of the Irish Daily Star is Frank's a million, 50 million euro for Lamps in three year deal at Chelsea. You've got the Wexford cohort celebrating their homecoming after winning the Leinster Hurling Championship uh, at the weekend. And Limerick set for Western Showdown. Mayo and Galway failed to agree on a coin toss for home advantage ahead of their clash in the qualifiers this weekend. If you are James Horn or if you're Kevin Walsh and a coin is put in front of you and you're like, lads, Saul Taylor Castlebar, toss that coin. Do you do it? Uh, Mayo's record in Castle Bar is what three defeats in nine games now, um, nine championship games in the last couple of seasons. So I was like, nah. I mean, I'm happy to beat you in Salt Hill.
or actually. So you, you, you do toss the coin then? I don't know. I'm, I'm. You're going for Gaelic rounds. Yeah. I mean, fair enough. No, I was, I was just, I was just wondering. I was like, when that came up yesterday, I was like, imagine that. You get knocked out of the championship away from home, and it was all down to the toss of a coin. People everywhere will blame you for actually getting your team knocked out of the championship. It would be a huge stake, so I can see why they, they settled for the neutral venue. Uh, also, they know Limerick better now. It's like it's basically a home ground after. Well, the sure, they got a draw line. against the All Ireland champions there. After the All Great result for them in 2014. Semi final replay. No? That's what I mean, yeah. They've, they've got a fantastic record there, unbeaten after normal time. Yeah, so after extra time. Well, they lost to the All Ireland champions after extra time. It was a very good result for the team that would want to be known as the best team to never win in All Ireland. Right, uh, good, good patronisation there. Never let it stop. Don't sleep on the patronising opportunity. Uh, Lyon Hats. It's uh, li Lion Hats. Lyon. Lyon. Um, the Lioness's nickname is also a lot of nonsense. But anyway, uh, trophy chasing England can test the favourites in showdown with USA. So, a nil all draw. Is that what we're saying? <coughs> Penalties? That England's best hope? Would that bring glory to your American-loving heart, seeing them beat the English on penalties? Is that the way you want it to happen tonight? I don't just, just beat them. It's World Cup semi-final. No one remembers semi-final zones. No, no prizes given out in semi-final. We're just keeping the head down, doing the work, wor worrying about the next game, not, not even thinking about the final. Just to go, I'm just worried about what hotel I'm staying in for the final. Mm. Uh, why patience is, with the Curra is wearing thin. David Jennings says the revamped home of flat racing needs to start getting it right and soon. So, uh, more controversy about the... Uh, Curra at the weekend at the Derby and um, strong stuff here from David Jennings in the Racing Post. The Curra is the joke that keeps on giving but the laughing has to stop. The bloopers reel at the Curra already has enough content, now the laughing simply has to stop. The Sunday of Irish Champions Weekend, the next big test for the track has now become the biggest day in Irish racing for decades. A parade ring not big enough for horses to parade around, an owner's lounge not big enough for owners, a grandstand which cost millions more than it was supposed to, the roof of that grandstand making a mysterious whistling noise that frightened the living daylights out of kids on Guinea's weekend, a crowd of 2,859 for the first day of the big three-day Irish Derby Festival, only 802 more to see a group one the following day, and that's just the first paragraph, so um, certainly the issues around the car aren't going away at the moment, and uh, the Racing Post going hard and heavy at it today. A couple of leads on the tennis yesterday. The Guardian goes with a teenager eclipses Venus, 15-year-old Corey Goff, the youngest ever player to qualify for the main draw at Wimbledon, pulled off one of the greatest opening day shocks to beat Venus Williams. And the moment of truth, never glory, is in our grasp. Just want to move quickly on uh, to the Daily Telegraph before we bring you an exclusive game that we've formalised uh, for this morning's OTB AM. It is also uh, Sweet 15. Teenage qualifier Goff stuns five-time champion Williams and vows to become the greatest. Before we get on to that, just to go through a couple of the quotes here. I'm not sure that you see her interviews in the immediate aftermath of beating Venus yesterday, but they're incredible. Some of her lines, she was like, I want to be the greatest. My dad told me that I could do this when I was eight. You just have to say things. If I'd gone into this match saying, let's see how many games I can get against her, then I most definitely would not have won. My dream was to win, and that's what happened. I think people limit themselves too much. I like to shoot high. She also said that her Twitter following would multiply by several numbers over the next couple of days. I didn't realise as well that this has sort of been a talent that's been looked after in the best possible way in a great academy in Florida. And she's also been signed up to Tony Godsick, which is Federer's agent, since she was 13. And she even has a deal with the same pasta company as Roger Federer. Uh, so it's incredible stuff uh, from the 15-year-old. And I said we'd have to play a brand new quiz show, uh, focusing on the idea of which uh, is older, Corey Goff or these certain things. So do you want to play the game, Ger? Yeah, let's do it. We've got seven things, and uh, I'm sure we'll have the music coming in just a moment to mm -hmm. bring the tension. Oh, there we go. That's right. How tense is this? Which is older, Corey Goff or Cork's weight for an All-Ireland senior hurling title? Corey Goff. Correct. Born in 2004, Cork, 2005, their last All-Ireland senior hurling title. Which is older, Corey Goff or the UK office? The UK office. Correct. Two from two. Corey Goff or Ireland smoking ban? Ireland smoking ban. No, Corey Goff. She was born 16 days ah, come on. before smokers weren't allowed indoors in Irish pubs. Corey Goff. When was she born? I'm not allowed to tell you that just yet. She's 15. You, well, okay, you can tell you can. No, she's, I'm not going to give you the exact month or exact date. Well, Corey come on, Goff. Uh, come on, you can give me the exact date. That, that would okay, be Mar March 13th, 2004. March 13th, 2004. Corey Goff or Shrek 2? 
Corey Goff. Correct. Shrek 2 is May 15. Corey Goff or the iPod Mini? Ooh, which is iPod older? Mini. iPod Mini. Gonna say the iPod Mini. Correct. Jeez, you're good at this game. These are too easy. Just two more. These are not easy. This is taking every last bit of my tired brain to work out. Corey Goff. Screw you, I'm just because I'm good at it. Corey Goff or Roger Federer's first Grand Slam? Uh, Roger Federer's first Grand Slam. What age is Federer? He's like um, 37. So is he I'm gonna go Corey Goff because it was Wimbledon? No. Oh, shit. Uh, Federer, 2003. All right. So, uh, yeah, the second one was 2004. And then finally, which is older. See, this is why I didn't want to give you the date. Uh, Corey Goff or Keen O'Connor's gold medal? Uh, well, Keen O'Connor was the summertime. Well, exactly, so Corey Goff. So, there you go. kind of ruined that last one, didn't you? Well, uh, yeah. Five yeah. from seven, not a bad result. Well done on the first ever and uh, probably last edition of Corey Goff or X, which is older. Great name. I mean, it works. Yeah. You could probably get a better name for it. Didn't have time this morning. That's all right. Uh, Mars, wait, this is a story. I don't know if you talked about this at all on yesterday's show or if it was uh, talked about much, but um, Tipstar could face ban for Casey Lunge. Tipperary defender Ronan Mar faces an anxious wait as Croke Park Central Competitions Control Committee, the CCCC. He's expected to review footage of an incident in his team's most final defeat to Limerick. Uh, this was an egregious straight red card, one of the most obvious straight red cards you're going to see in a hurling match. And I realised that um, the, mostly the refereeing of the hurling was fairly like, I'm going to get out of the way here, lads, do what you want. And that's absolutely fine. I think everybody wants it like that. But when Ronan Marr lifts the elbow, He's got to go, and I don't think anybody's going to complain about that. I don't think Tiff fans are like, oh no, you can't, this is a witch hunt against him. It's like, he should have been sent off, he needs to face a ban for this, because otherwise, otherwise all the stuff they talked about head injuries at the start of the year was nonsense. You can't have head injuries being a thing. I mean, there was a couple of other bits where um, uh, Wexford were coming out with the ball, and the Kilkenny man was down, and uh, the referee called it back, and this is at the very end of the game, and it ended up being a throw-in. I was like, hang on a second now. Because it, it must have, the only way it could have happened was because it was a head injury. And uh, who was talking about this? Were you guys talking about this yesterday's show? Eamon we Fitzmaurice? were. Yeah, Eamon Fitzmaurice was talking on Saturday. Mayo. Kieran McGinney in his post-match comments that very day. He was talking Mayo. Yeah. Being great at using head injuries as a means of stopping play. Yeah, but Fitzmaurice was talking about Mayo and their dark arts and how they will use any trick under the sun to ensure that they get the competitive advantage, which is... Obviously, if you want to be a high-performing team in Gaelic games these days, there are so many ways to what? circumvent the rules. So what do you do if you're a team in possession? Like, so... Uh, the Kilkenny... Uh, I might be remembering this wrong, but as far as I remember, the Kilkenny guy goes down, play continues, play continues, play continues, play continues, and then it's scoring opportunity for Kilkenny, gets blocked down, Wexford are clearing it, and they have possession, and it's near the very end of the game. And it's very key moment. It's a big yeah. turnover. It's Lee Chin in possession. Crowd's gone wild. Referee goes, <laughs> head injury over here. I don't know if it was a head injury or not. And then threw the ball in, deep, yeah. deep in Wexford territory. And I'm like, what? If they lose this? If they score off this? I, I, I immediately thought that that would have been one of the biggest talking points of the weekend had Wexford not won on Sunday. That was, I don't know what happened there. What was the exact rule? Because if it's a head injury, it needs to be stopped immediately. Play developed for a significant amount of time. I really just did not understand what the referee was doing there. Maybe there was a head injury off screen that perhaps we didn't you see. Could, you could see an injury. I don't know if it was a head you injury. You didn't know it was okay, no, fair enough. It just like like so somebody that, that was has down. to be what the ref was thinking, but to actually allow it to develop like that. Yeah, but at that point, right, when it's Wexford possession, you can't penalize them no. for having possession, which is what happens. So I don't know about that rule. Unless you go down the soccer way of actually, you know, playing the ball out of play. I see the Dubs were actually booing somebody for not kicking the ball out of play uh, last week, or at least it seemed like that. Um, I don't think we got to the Irish Times. I think it's a final newspaper. It's Kevin McStay leading the way. Uh, defeat in Connacht showdown will cast long shadow, talking about Mayo. I know what I hope at the end, though, from Kevin McStay. I think Mayo are going to the All-Ireland. Do you? Yeah. Give me the group. They're going to be Galway this weekend, I think. And then, then they go to Killarney. Who are you backing in that game? So they've got Galway this week. They've got Armagh, Galway and Kerry in successive weeks. Yeah. And then Donegal the week after or is it a week break? No, Donegal uh, a few weeks later than that. They'll have Donegal and Castle Barra. They will go to Croke Park and play either Clare or Meath. Who are you backing in that game? Who are you backing against Kerry and Killarney? You're backing Mayo in both of those games. 
I'm they not will go backing. In. I'm not they will backing go Mayo into the, to carry. They will go into the final game in Castle Barrett, four points up against Donegal. Ah, Mayo are going you back to the All Ireland final. You don't believe they're going down talk to Kerry? Talk to me about Mayo's recent record in Kerry. Extremely good. Talk to me about uh, Mayo's recent record against Kerry in big games. Extremely good. There's, there's two weeks of yarrying to be done. You're yarrying about a fiction that doesn't even exist yet, so we'll wait for that. Uh, Irish examiner sports, uh, Derek McGrath, despite Harry Munster final, Tip will still be in the All-Ireland final. He put his, um, he's nailed his colours to the mast and picked the All-Ireland final for you. He says Tip are going to beat Wexford in a close game, in a classic, in a semi-final that'll be full of Wexford people. So um, I'd, I'd say let's wait and see how, uh, what kind of stead they're in. Well, the key line, can I just go through the key line in Derek McGrath's column? Uh, one just very briefly before we get to Eddie Brennan. The, oh wait, we can leave it to later. Uh, Kilkenny legend and leashed hurling boss Eddie Brennan is uh, going to join us next.